Now, last week we said that we were going to follow these parables along according to a theological phrase that's called expositional constancy. An expositional constancy says if a figure is used to represent something in one passage, then every time it's used, it represents the same thing. This is very important to do this and to follow this rule in studying the parables, lest we get off on some, uh, to quote a phrase, magical mystery tour. You know, and who knows where we might end up if, uh, if, if there isn't some consistency in really... Um, following through Jesus' thought on the parables. Uh, I don't know what you have thought about them as you have read them. Uh, I believe that I will probably take a position that is not a traditional position on the parables. And so uh, it's just going to give you some food for thought, maybe, uh, as I don't really take what is the traditional uh, view. But I'll point that out as we go. The second parable is actually the first of the mystery of the kingdom parables. Let's just go ahead and begin reading in chapter 13, uh, verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and they said to him, Sir, did we not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them uh, in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. And all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables and without a parable he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying I will open my mouth in parables I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world and then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying explain to us the parable of the terrors of the field and he answered and said to them he who sows the good seed is the son of man The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. And there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Father, we ask that um, as we, uh, Lord, seek to to go through these parables this morning, Lord, that you would give us uh, understanding. Uh, Lord, that our uh, eyes would be opened and our ears open, Lord, to hear uh, what you would be teaching, Lord, uh, through these parables. We ask for your grace to come upon us, Lord. And we praise you, Lord, for, uh, God, just your presence here among us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Verses 24 to 30 is a, is a basic parable that he put forth to them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field now remember the field is the world one thing that we can get maybe confused at is if we start to think of the field as being the church the church is not necessarily what he's talking about here the field is the world while men slept his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat 
and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and to uh, gather up the tares? And guess cast them out, but he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in a bundle to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now it's pretty clear, to me anyway, that Jesus is saying here that the kingdom of heaven... And that really basically boils down to heaven's rule on earth while Christ is away. And what we've learned, particularly from the first parable, the parable of the soils and the parable of the sower, is that not everyone is going to receive the word, not everyone is going to believe the word, not everyone is going to obey the word during this time. And what Jesus is really saying here is the kingdom of heaven on earth is not going to be a perfect representation in any way of the kingdom of heaven because it would include both a mixture of the false as well as the true and the good and the bad. And Jesus will explain this parable as we read in just a few verses. Here he simply says that a man went out and sowed good seed in his field but also that an enemy came out and he sowed bad seed in the field. And he calls those seeds tares. And the word uh, is the word ziganzian. And it means a weed. And basically what it is, it's, it's a weed that resembles wheat, except that it is poisonous. Uh, the real danger is that they closely resemble the wheat until their final stages of growth when it's apparent then that they're not going to bring forth any fruit. But they look very much the same as they're, as they're starting to just sprout up and starting to grow. Uh, they are a nuisance. They drain the soil of its nutrients. They take up space. But the key that I think we need to notice here is they are unidentifiable until this time when, of the harvest. Uh, when it was discovered that tares had been sown among the wheat, his servants wanted to come and dig them up, but they were told not to, that Jesus would then send his reapers, uh, who we see are the angels, to do this job. Now, at this point, Jesus then gives another parable. And I believe that the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven really help us to understand what he's telling us in this parable. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of, of leaven just in order that Jesus uh, spoke to the multitude here. And then we'll look at the, the, uh, the explanation of the, ter the parable of the tares and the wheat. So he says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. So very small, very small seed in comparison to, uh, to all other seeds. He even says here is the least of all the seeds. It's a very small seed in the, uh, in, in the um, herb world, if you will. When it's grown, he says, of this particular seed is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So he tells us here that he's likening the kingdom of heaven under this mustard seed. A very small seed, as I said, in comparison uh, to other seeds. Uh, we plant these seeds many times. We have a little herb garden. Or we can have a little, um, a little you know, some people put these in little boxes and they put them in their windows. Uh, but they're, they're basically, they just bring forth then um, these little plants. Now actually, uh, a mustard seed can grow to about 7 to 10 feet into this gigantic bush. Uh, becoming a, a rather large bush if planted outside. But we're told here that this particular one became a tree. And this is the part that kind of, you know, doesn't sit too well with me. But it says that this one becomes a tree so much so that the birds of the air come and lodge in it. Now what is Jesus wanting to teach us here in this parable? 
And as I said, there are differences of interpretation, particularly with these next two. And I just want to point out, the first interpretation says that Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven has this very little, tiny, small beginning. But in time, it grows and grows and grows and grows until it has a very influential effect upon the world, attracting a wide variety of people represented by the birds. Now, this all might sound pretty good, but there are some problems with this, especially if we're going to follow expositional constancy to interpret this parable. And I believe that as we go through, we're going to see more clearly that Jesus is definitely reinforcing what he said in the first parable, that uh, he's giving insight that the representation of the kingdom of heaven is really not going to have uh, the kind of effect that really many people in Christendom think that it's going to have today or think that it is having today. It's not going to be so universally accepted. Uh, only a quarter of the seed, remember, only a quarter of the seed really fell upon good ground and produced fruit. Some 30, some 60, and some a hundredfold. The second interpretation, and the one that I really embrace says that though the outward manifestation of this kingdom will grow, it's going to have abnormal growth. And anyone is going to tell you that a mustard seed is not going to grow into a tree. It may grow into a big, large bush, as I said earlier, but it's not going to grow into a tree at least large enough that it's going to support uh, birds nesting in it. I also have problems with the birds representing, basically, um, believers. Because throughout the scripture, they represent anything but believers. Birds represent evil in scripture. And if we're going to follow expositional constancy again, then what we have here is uh, something very different than is traditionally taught. Uh, in the scripture... Most often this type of bird, figuratively, is used as bad. And in the sense of the parables, Jesus has just said they are representative, in verse 19, of the wicked one. And so we've got to stay with that. They rep birds represent evil, and certainly the wicked one in 19 is Satan. And if it means that in one place, then we've got to really follow this through, uh, throughout the interpretation of the parables. Um, and I want you to give serious consideration to this because this is not the traditional view. But I do not believe that Jesus is trying to teach us here in these parables how great and how impactful the kingdom of heaven is going to have upon the earth and upon the world. I believe just the opposite is really true. I believe that he is saying that the outward manifestation of the kingdom might look like one thing, but in fact, it is something very different than what it appears to be. I believe that maybe more accurately, the worldwide council of churches would represent the mustard seed growing into this big organization here. Um, if you look at, and you don't, I just jot these down because I want you just to follow me through here. But in Daniel chapter 4, verse 12, as well as in Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 23, and chapter 31 of Ezekiel, uh, verse 3, we find that a tree is used symbolically of world powers. Now, I believe that um, what may appear what we call Christendom. Basically, that's a word to define the outward manifestation of um, the worldview of Christianity, okay? Uh, the worldwide council of churches. In a sense, it has become a very powerful organization with worldwide power, many branches spreading out, uh, having a lot of political influence throughout the world. One that basically supports every wind of doctrine that comes along. And this is one of the reasons that we do not join with nor embrace the programs that they put forth. When the World Council of Churches is behind something, we pretty much take a standoffish view towards that. 
simply because it's not speaking of just Christianity. It's speaking of a conglomerate of churches. If you just call yourself a church, you know, you can become a part of this worldwide council. And so we do not promote the things that this organization puts forth, nor do we come alongside and join them. They're just waiting for a, for a church that, that, profess, that confesses Jesus Christ as Lord and stands upon the truth of God's Word to come along and join them where His Word is compromised at so many different turns. And so we will not come alongside them. We will not identify them. We will not be compromised by being included uh, with what they want to present. If we follow what Jesus is saying here, the mustard seed does start out small. But it certainly didn't follow its natural course of growth in becoming a tree. The parable does not, in my understanding of the scripture, represent the worldwide success of the gospel, as many suggest. If anything, the New Testament teaches, and I believe history would bear out, a growing decline in the ministry of the gospel. All you have to do is go back to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And follow the progression of the seven churches of Revelation. Starting with Ephesus, where do you end up? You end up at Laodicea, which is the last day's church. What's happening in the last day's church? Who's standing at the door knocking, trying to get into his own church? Jesus Christ. The other interpretation sounds nice. Because we want to believe that the gospel message is going to have just a powerful effect and there's just going to be this massive worldwide uh, you know, acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's not realistic. And therefore, I believe that what this parable actually does teach is that though the kingdom of God may start out as this little, little tiny seed, it does have abnormal growth. You know, within the church today, with, if, if we just look at not only what we call the kingdom of heaven, which is not the church per se, but where the seed has been sown into the world, and we look at the kingdom of heaven, where everyone is not embracing Jesus Christ, where everyone is not obeying his word, even within the church, though, we have come to a place of so much compromise, it's ridiculous. The word of God is not the basic foundation upon what a lot of so-called Christian churches embrace. Liberal theology will give you just about any interpretation of it that you want. Within the professing church, the word's compromised. The word's compromised to accommodate whatever itching ears might want to hear. Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica and he said, As we have been allowed by God to be trusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing God who tries our hearts. And I'll tell you what, the word of God is going to offend. The word of God is going to offend people because it challenges people and it causes people to come to a place of commitment in their life. It causes people to come to a place of obedience. It causes people to come and recognize sin in their life. And that that sin must be dealt with. And God said, I dealt with it at the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. But today, because of liberal theology, we have this huge organization, basically, with branches that will accommodate whatever one wants to hear. It was interesting that this week, this very week in uh, World Magazine, this article came out, Gospel-Free Christianity. And it's so amazing that it speaks right here of the very thing that I believe is, is being, uh, that, that Jesus is showing us here. I'll, I'll just read a paragraph of it. I'll let it lay around here if you want to grab it and, and just take a look at the article. But it says, The virtual evaporation of Christian conviction is one of the most striking features of postmodern America. And this is certainly most ominous for the church. The larger culture 
is now a theology-free zone in which Christian conviction may be tolerated as long as congregations resemble little more than special interest organizations with pretty buildings and religious entertainment. And it goes on to tell what, uh, they, what they call here as the golden rule Christians define their faith in terms of practice, not doctrine. The golden rule Christians want to retain at least some connection to classical Christianity. They want their faith to be grounded in the Bible, but, cert not, but certainly not in a literal reading of it. Golden Rule Christians are concerned with the development of their personal lives and spirituality with helping others to make the world a better place with doing good deeds. But again, as they go on to talk about the conviction of sin and dealing with that is an issue that many churches today are just skirting over uh, that issue. And so... Um, I believe that the interpretation better describes uh, this little seed that grew up abnormally into a tree. And uh, it's, a, it's an organization, but not the true organiza organism uh, of Christianity. Are you with me here okay? You, okay. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until it was all leavened. Now, leaven's this little piece of fermented dough that they, you know, a woman will put in a woman. Man, I guess we have bakers too, don't we? <laughs> we have bakerettes and bakers, you know. But you take this little piece of, uh, of um, a fermented dough from the last batch and you stick it in with the, with, the new, with the new dough and it causes it to rise and it makes the bread just real tasty. And uh, uh, so, you know, you can kind of gather what is going on here. This parable also has two interpretations. Uh, basic interpretations. And the first one, again, is meant to mean that the kingdom of heaven is going to expand and permeate into all the world until it gradually influences all the world for good. Well, I ask, how are we doing? How is the church of Jesus Christ doing if that is where we're going to put our focus, where the true word of God has been received? If we're not doing real well right now, then I'm going to tell you the time is running out. And something better happen pretty quickly because we're coming to the end of the age and whatever influence the gospel is having, it sure doesn't seem like it's tasting very good to a lot of people. Unless, of course, it's a gospel-free gospel. And then it's not good news at all, is it? Because the gospel is the good news. And if the good news doesn't tell us that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, came to this world, came to this earth to die for, this, for our sins, you know, then we got problems. Because then Paul said, even as we studied a couple weeks ago on Resurrection Sunday, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then we're still dead in our sins. And our faith is in vain. And we all should be out fishing today or doing something else rather than just being here, you know, hearing uh, the Word of God preached and proclaimed. It seems to me that other religions of the world seem to be having quite a bit of success today. Quite a bit of influence in the world. But at any rate, those who study the Bible, I believe, here again, are making a big stretch to suggest that leaven is the gospel influence in the world for good. Why do I say that? Well, in Scripture, leaven is also always used as a principle of evil. Every time it's used in the Scripture, it's used in a negative and in a bad sense. Let me give you a couple of examples Jot them down. Luke chapter 12, verse 1, where Jesus warned of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And so there he, he um, uh, correlates leaven with hypocrisy. In Matthew chapter 16, that we'll get to shortly, verses 6 through 12, 
Jesus again using this statement and warning his disciples of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, he suggests that it's worldly compromise. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, the Apostle Paul writes, Your glorying is not good. Now this was a church, the Corinthian church was a compromising church, and they were glorying in the way that they had excused sin in the body. And they thought they were being very gracious to do so. And Paul is really rebuking him. You're glorying is them. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Take just a little piece of this fermented leaven and put it in the whole batch for the next loaf and whoosh, it just blows up. What's Paul speaking of here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6? He's speaking of the carnality within the church. He goes on in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 5 to say, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. So here it's correlated to malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now that's very interesting. Because as I say, it's used as a symbol of sin and evil. It was removed in every Jewish home during Passover. Exodus chapter 12, they had to um, you know, clean out the house of all uh, leaven, get it out. All, and it was symbolic of getting sin out of the house. Exodus chapter 12, verses 15 through 19, chapter 13, uh, verse 7. It was excluded from all sacrifices made unto the Lord. Exodus 34, verse 25. Leaven was excluded from all sacrifices with one exception. And that exception is found in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 through 21, when loaves were used as a sacrifice and an offering to the Lord during Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost? Well, at Pentecost, there was uh, a new group that was established. And this new group that was established was called the church. It was made up of Jews and Gentiles. Now, we know today that there is sin in the church. And so, in that one and only sacrifice that was made unto the Lord, leaven was allowed. Interesting, huh? God doesn't miss a lick. He does not miss a lick. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, Paul uses that same phrase, a little leaven, leavens the whole lump, to define false doctrine within the church. So leaven, with just those examples, is always used as a principle of evil and that which is bad. Remember now, these parables are a picture of what effect the Word of God is going to have on earth during the time from Christ's ascension till the time that He comes back to reign in power and glory. And so as we look at these parables, what do we see? Well, the meal, of course, would represent the Word of God. It's grain, the seed that was sown. The seed is the Word. And so again, the grain uh, has been, um, would be the Word of God. But what's it been mixed with? It's been mixed with leaven. That which is false doctrine and false teaching. But it's made it palatable, tasty, yummy to so many. And that's why we have, you know, this, this gospel-free Christianity today. That's why the cults, I believe, are so um, attractive. You see, there's no conviction of the word in cults. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Where's my little magazine? <laughs> I just want, can't, can't find it. I hid it under here. <laughs> What's he saying? The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
What did that article begin to tell us? That we should already know that the gospel is being compromised within the Christian church today. The gospel of Jesus Christ is being compromised in the church of Jesus Christ today. It will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, tell me something good. Tell me what I want to hear. Make it easy. Make it easy. Hey, I'll tell you, how much easier could it get? How much easier? And for God to give His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. He says they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside unto fables. If I told you that the one mixing the leaven in, if I told you the one that's mixing it in to the to the way in scripture is also used in a doctrinal sense as a principle of evil. Don't get upset with me. <laughs> but all you have to do is look at the book of Revelation, chapter two. When Jezebel is mentioned. And as we get later on into the book. uh, Chapter 17. Where she's represented as the great harlot. Deceiving many. What do I see in this parable? Once again. What I see. And I believe that the Bible teaches. Is that the pure word of God. Is going to be permeated with false doctrine. And false teaching. In the last days. What was Jesus saying? When he asked his disciples, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith? Now, I don't think so. I think when he comes, he's going to find uh, maybe quite a bit less than that. These parables are giving us an insight into what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like on earth while he is away. There will be a false gospel that will be taught. There will be false brethren. False brethren. Among us. The Bible also tells us that there will be a false Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. A false church. Revelation chapter 2. This is what Jesus is telling us that we can expect when he is away. Not one that's having just this massive influence. But one where really is having just what I believe the opposite effect in the hearts and the lives of men in the world. Satan has infiltrated the church itself. There's compromise within the church. False doctrine and false teaching. And that presents a challenge before us today. A challenge to be faithful and obedient to the word of God ourselves. To really believe this and take it to heart and live according to what the word says by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you see, I can't live this in my own flesh, in my own energy. In my own strength. I can only live. That's why the Sermon on the Mount was so powerful. Because Jesus was teaching there that, you know, and that's, you love it. You know, we're talking about golden rule Christianity in this article in World, in World Magazine. Because people say, I'll just live my life according to the golden rule. You know, or according to the Sermon on the Mount. Well, how long does it time? How long does it take for us to come to that passage? You know, where it tells us to uh, pray for those who despitefully use us and hate us. You know, how long does it take for us to really love our neighbor? For love that one that despitefully uses us. Yeah, I'll pray for him. Go get him, God. Pray like the Old Testament. You know. <laughs> That's not what God is saying here, but that's a very difficult thing for us to do. We're challenged to walk in a manner that's worthy of the Lord. Paul tells us in Colossians, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I believe that the parable, both of these parables teach us but that which blows up, that bread, that loaf, whatever, it's not a picture of the church having a massive impact for good in the world today, but showing just the opposite, that it's going to grow and blow up because false doctrine has permeated the church and it's caused compromise and made the gospel an easy believism for a lot of people who really do not know anything about a commitment 
to Jesus Christ and having their sins forgiven. Verse 34 tells us that all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables and without a parable he did not speak that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying I will open my mouth in parables I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world and so again nothing that is happening at this particular time has taken God by surprise. He knew exactly what was going to happen during the time that his son was crucified at Calvary to the time that he arose, to the time he's in heaven, and this period of time that we live in right now, this time of grace. But God knew that his word was not going to be embraced fully and completely. And so he says this is another answer to prophecy. These things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying I will open my mouth in parables I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. And then Jesus sent the multitude away. Now he's just got his own disciples among him. And his disciples, they go into the house and his disciples came to him and they said explain to us the parable of the terrors of the field. And so he answered and he said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. Now here, though, it tells us that the good seeds are the Son of the kingdom. And so here, it's those to whom the seed has taken root and has begun to bring forth fruit. But the terrors are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Now it should start to become, I think, very clear to us. As the good seed of the word is sown in the world, it began to take root in some lives. And believers come out of it. And they go out into the world to bear fruit for the kingdom. But at the same time, Satan has also sown tares in the world. He has a counterfeit. And that counterfeit's effective in many, many ways. It's easy to grab onto. It's easy to be believed. It's something that sounds good and feels good. And Jesus tells us that these two the representatives of God and the representatives of the enemy, Satan, are going to go out and are going to coexist even within the church, but not specifically meant that. But they're going to go out and coexist uh, in the world to the end of the age when Jesus sends his angels to separate the tares from the wheat. I like this, what Jesus says here, because his, you know, his disciples, his servants came, you know, it says the servants of the man came who sowed the good seed, and he said, hey, you want us to go out and take care of those bad seed out there? And I like what Jesus said, because he said no. He said, no, you wait until the harvest, and I will send my reapers. Because the truth of the matter is, you and I as his servants, we don't know who really are a part of his kingdom. We don't know that. It's not our judgment call to make. Now, we might think we have a pretty good idea because the Bible also says you will know them by their fruit. But we really don't know for sure. And so what we need to do is we need to let God take care of this in his time and in his way. Because, you know, we might wipe those out. We might say, well, let's go out and just wipe out all of Islam. Wipe them out. Hey, you know, they're contrary to Christianity. But you know what? The seed is being sown in Islamic world today, in the Islamic world today. And there are many who are coming to Jesus Christ through the sowing of the seed. And so it's very important what Jesus said here. If we would go and pluck them up, man, we would, we would make a mess of things. You know? We'd make a mess of things right here in the church. And I'm not specifically just thinking of, of, of this body of believers and this part of the body of Christ here, but in the church in general. You know, we can shake our fingers at those that call themselves Christians, and we really may not have any real good reason to do that. 
You know, we might pass someone on and say, hey, yeah, I know they'll be in heaven with us, but you know what? God really only knows. Because God's the one that looks upon our hearts, and God's the one that really knows what's going on in our hearts. And He knows if there's been a shallow commitment made to Him or whether that commitment is a real commitment. A real commitment made unto Him. There are many that might appear to be believers who in fact aren't. And there are many that we might suspect who are. Or who aren't that are. Right here in the church today, there are those that regularly go to church, carry a big Bible, have a fish on their car, have their names written on a church register somewhere. They even tithe, involved in the church. But they've never really entered into a personal and living relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he says, you wait till the end of the age when those who do know will be able to take care of business. Therefore, verse 40, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire and there will be wailing and gnashing of the teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, The Lord knows those who are His. God will separate the tares from the wheat and He'll do a real good job you know, doing that. And it says that the tares will be cast into everlasting darkness, into the furnace of fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now people don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear it. I don't know how many of you want to hear it today. I don't know how many of you make it uncomfortable to know that, yes, there will be judgment. Because it's not very pleasant. We've been reading the book of Isaiah. We understand and we see that, you know, judgment is, it grieves our heart. I want you to know that it grieves God's heart. Because God said, it's not my desire that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so it grieves the heart of God. But the truth of the matter is, is the gospel cannot be compromised or watered down. And if it is, then it's no longer the gospel. If you want to hear that everyone's going to heaven because, you know, we all do good and we all think good thoughts and, you know, we do nice things and God's just going to excuse sin, if these churches even believe that there is such a thing, as sin, and you probably want to go someplace else. And I could suggest a place here in town, you know, that there's lots of compromise going on there. And what really gets me about the compromise is the fact that they call themselves in their title of their name Christian. And they're not Christian. They're not Christian. They present that false gospel and that false Christ. They even say that, you know what? Just look deep within, and you can become even as. You know, that theology that's being taught down on the corner of Folsom and Valmont is as old as the Mormon church, because that's what they teach, too. You can have your own little religion, your own little planet, your own little world. They won't tell you that God has judged sin at Calvary once and for all the sacrifice of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. He paid that price so that you and I wouldn't have to. And I thank Him for that and rejoice in that today. He, prayed, he paid the price for sin so that we wouldn't have to experience the judgment to come upon a Christ-rejecting world. And I say thank you, Lord, for that. But He clearly tells us the judgment is coming. The Bible tells us that judgment is coming. But I want you to know that this is the day of grace. And God's arms are outstretched through His Son, Jesus Christ, to receive all who will come to Him in faith. And who will recognize that they are a sinner who needs a Savior. For neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I'm not making this up. 
It's taught in this book. And I believe this book with all my heart. And I believe the one in whom this book is written about. And that's why sometimes I think when you come here and you feel like, well, Richie, you're getting a little hard on us, aren't you? I tell you what, I don't know who's here every time. And if it's getting hard on you, then maybe you need, you know, to search your heart. To see if you're of the faith. What did Paul say to the Corinthian church? Search your heart to see if you're of the faith. And if it sounds like I'm coming down on you because I don't know who is out here, I don't know how many people just come and sit in Christian churches. You know, they go from this church to that church to this church, and they think, well, because I went to church today, I went to a Christian church today, everything's fine and dandy in my life. And so therefore, I try to make it very clear in this church every single Sunday because I don't know who is here. That this isn't about a casual relationship. It's about a serious commitment. And it's important to me. Because I want to make sure that everyone that hears the word of God preached in here knows the consequences of receiving or rejecting the word of God. And it's not about having a name written on a church register somewhere, you know. I mean, when I was 13 years old, I had my name written on a church register in the Methodist Church in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And that meant no more that I was going to heaven than anything. Because I didn't know. I went to church because my girlfriend went to church. That was, the, that was the only reason I went to church. I didn't know until I was 33 years old and this fella took the time to come and explain the gospel of Jesus Christ to me. That I could, number one, have a relationship with Jesus Christ, a personal and intimate relationship with him, but that I needed to have one with him so that I could be saved from my sins. But that also meant that I had to acknowledge that I was a sinner. And the Bible tells me that the wages of sin is death, separation from God for all eternity. But the good news is the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Judgment's coming. It's coming. But the free gift of God offered to man, woman, child today is that Jesus Christ loves you so much that he died for your sins. And now the, the ball's bounced back into man's court. And it's up to man to believe. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we humble ourselves before you, Lord. And pray, Father, that as we speak forth the word of God today and interpret, Lord, the, the parables here, Lord, that have two very basic but different meanings, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we have not done disservice to you or to your word today, Lord, and what, what we have said and what we proclaim and what we believe, Lord. It grieves our heart, Lord, to see how your word, the pure word of the gospel has been compromised today, Lord. And we ask for forgiveness for that, Lord. Forgiveness within the Christian church, the forgiveness, Lord, within our own lives. Father, we know that we are not a perfect church here. And all we can ask, Lord, is for forgiveness for our sin, Lord, and ask God that you... Teach us, Lord, that we may grow and mature and become, Lord, uh, Lord, the best that we can be in the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, in representing you in the world. And Father, today, as we always do, we close, Lord, by just asking, Lord, that if you have brought any here today, who have never come into a personal and living relationship with you through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. But Lord, they understand that, Lord, there is judgment to come. And Father, we don't know when that time might come in a person's life. We don't know when we walk out of here today, Lord, if some of us will cross that line into eternity. And the 
thing, Lord, is, is that each one of us, Lord, I pray, before we walk out this door today, would know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would receive, God, your free gift of grace by opening their heart to receive you. Lord, as we humble ourselves before you, we just ask, God, that if you brought any here today, any at all, Lord, any at all, God, that would open their heart to you and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and take me into your family. If that's you today, can I pray for you? If that's you today, if God is reaching out to you, knocking upon the door of your heart today, will you receive that gift that he so graciously offers to you? And even as the Bible says that as the Son of Man was raised up, so we would ask you today to make a stand for him. And so while we are in prayer, in the attitude of prayer, if there's anyone at all today, anyone at all, that would open their heart to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, to receive his free gift and grace of the forgiveness of sin, and have that promise of eternity and eternal life with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Can I pray for you today? Will you stand right where you're seated? Anyone at all? Anyone? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to share your word, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we remain faithful to your word, Lord, and obedient to you, Lord. And we just ask God today now, Lord, that you'd pour your spirit out upon us, Father. I pray that you bless, Lord, and encourage each one, God, that has come today. I pray, Lord, that, Father, as we deal with things in our life, Directions, goals that we set, opportunities that are before us, decisions that we must make. I pray, Lord, that you would be included in each one of those, Lord. Included, Lord, to where we seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, knowing that all things else will follow into place. Now, Father, I just pray for this group of people here today, Lord, and I ask God for your, for your grace upon them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that your word... Your living word, Lord, would have an impact, Lord, upon each one of our lives, taking us, God, further in our walk with you than, Lord, when we came in even today. And, Father, we do ask just a special blessing, Lord, upon those mothers who are with us today, Lord. We just ask, God, for your blessing upon them, your grace upon them, Lord. And, and Father, may this just be a very special day for each one, Lord. We thank you, God, and we just rejoice in you, Jesus Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we've had this morning. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Glory, glory. Glory, glory. Hallelujah.
before his presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.